Ladies and gentlemen, it's very nice to see so many of you here. It's so good to see so many of you here that I wonder if any of you could start, who's not sat down yet, could move in that direction so latecomers can um, uh, actually have a chance to get some seating. So the gentleman just coming in, if you might just go and sit on that side, that would be fantastic. So that creates some space for people who arrive late. Thank you so much. And those just coming in, if you might just kindly move to that side, that would be fantastic. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So lovely to see you all here. My name is Catherine Barnard. I'm a senior fellow in uh, UK and a Changing Europe. And we have a fantastic panel for this session um, when we're going to be looking at UK EU relations. So on my left is Stefan de Rink. Um, he's a man who wears a number of hats. Um, he works for the European Commission, but is here speaking in a personal capacity. He was Michel Barnier's right-hand man, or at least one of them, over the uh, negotiations um, of the uh, withdrawal agreement from TCA. And he's written about it in a fascinating book called Inside the Deal, How the EU Got Brexit Done. So you get a fair idea where he's coming from. Uh, on my right is uh, Simon Usherwood, who's Professor of Politics and International Studies um, at the Open University and a Senior Fellow in UK in a Changing Europe. And to his right is Tom Harwood, uh, Deputy Political Editor of GB News. And online, I hope, is Katie Hayward, as we speak, as if by magic. There's Katie. Um, welcome, Katie. Lovely to see you. Professor of Political Sociology at Queen's University, Belfast, who knows more about uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol and the Windsor Framework uh, than perhaps um, anyone else um, in this country and probably in Northern Ireland too. So it's lovely uh, to see you all here, to welcome you here. Um, as you know, we'll take questions on Slido. Um, I realise that some of you are not so keen on Slido, but it's a good way of being able to keep an eye on the questions as they come in. Nobody's going to do a presentation um, as such, but we've got some questions that we will ask and um, perhaps address. And then, um, obviously, we'll take any questions we can via Slido, and I'll try and intersperse them as and when uh, we uh, get to the relevant point. So I wonder if we could just start with a bit of limbering up and just, just give us an overview of where we all are at the moment and what you think the position is. Stefan, do you want to start? OK, thank you. Um, well, we are. Thank you for the kind words on the book. Let me start about we're in a very different situation today from from that period that also Andrea Letzum and Anne and Menon commented on before in terms of hung parliament in the UK and, and, and all that kind of stuff. The political mood music is certainly much better, and I'll come back to that. But I think the key point in terms of where we are today is that for the first time in four years, we are in a situation where the, trade, the two agreements that we have and which structure the EU-UK relationship are applied and, and are complied with uh, on both sides uh, of the channel. And, so that was already the case, of course, with the trade and cooperation agreement. There hasn't been any major implementation difficulties there. There have been some issues, and those things have been discussed uh, within all the, the specialized committees since 2022. All the, the institutional framework is also in place. I did a bit of a count before coming here. There were like 50 meetings in 2022 at all levels, from the Partnership Council down to the <clears throat> excuse me, the most technical committee. Um, and on the EU side, I think politically the, the trade and cooperation agreement is perceived as a good agreement. That differs perhaps a bit, if I, again, Catherine to speak in a personal capacity and comment a bit on the UK debate, it seems to be that the media debate at least, or 
that focuses a lot on the negative impact of, of what Brexit has done to the UK economy and to EU-UK trade, but that's basically on our side looked at as a feature of this agreement, uh, as a feature of the FTA compared, compared to membership. So in that sense, TCA has been applied correctly with some minor issues since, since January 2021. And then, of course, the big game changer is on, on the withdrawal agreement, the second agreement that structures the relationship between the EU and the UK um, with, with the Windsor framework. And again, that's after four years of uh, non-compliance and litigation from the Commission or pre-litigation phase on the Commission. So the, the relationship was in that sense in 21, 22 somewhat deteriorating. And for lucky we have kind of turned the page on, on that episode. I see three reasons why Windsor early 2023 was possible and perhaps only then possible. One is that the situation, in, the incentives have changed. There's no longer that whole discussion as, as I have in the book and as we discussed with Andrea Letson before on no deal, no Brexit, sabotage, second referendum, cliff edge, all those issues are gone. And that creates the structural environment for a much more fruitful relationship. In my view, time has passed by, and so real life concerns of communities in Northern Ireland, uh, unintended consequences of what was agreed in 19. So that led us to use that article 164, and it says that four years into the withdrawal agreement, we can still correct omissions, deficiencies, and errors. So, that's the legal basis for that Windsor deal. And finally, it's a political choice, I think, from both Rishi Sunak and, on our side, Ursula von der Leyen, to create a kind of relationship based on an honest, honest conversation of where we are, also based common, finding common ground, rather than looking for confrontation or empty rhetoric uh, on, on Brussels. Um, and so in that sense, the, the Windsor framework is also in terms of negotiation style or interaction style. Uh, beyond the substantive issues that it does, um, a, a game changer in my view. And that, and perhaps that's my final point, the, of course the, the geopolitical environment underpins all of that and the Ukraine war. Uh, to, to have a situation whereby uh, Brussels and London are in this litigation, kind of non-compliance with withdrawal agreement accusations, of course was, would have been a ridiculous situation in, in, in the broader context in terms of the war in Ukraine and what Russia is trying to do with its own, with its violations of uh, international law. Thank you. Thank you. So, Katie, Winter Framework, Game Changer. Oh, you've got, we've got no sound, Katie. Oh. That's better. We can hear you now. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm sorry I can't be with you in person and I'm conscious I'm looming over you and I'll try not to do so menacingly. Um, and in that vein, I will um, pick up on the positive tone that uh, Stefan has begun with in terms of the political choice. So obviously, typically we've seen Northern Ireland at the crux of disagreement and confrontation between the UK and the EU and in the Windsor framework, we see quite a different um, atmosphere. Um, and I think that is due to three things as well. So the first is that the agreement that we saw in the Windsor framework was based on evidence and, and evidence that both the UK and the EU had accepted and was drawing upon from stakeholders here. They were listening to um, um, businesses and other stakeholders. So using that evidence to, particularly on the part of the EU, to reassess the element of risk and therefore to make uh, progress. Um, also, we've seen something very significant, I think, in the Windsor framework, which is a belief in the possibility of finding mutually agreeable solutions and a commitment to continue to do that. So that is a significant adjustment from, again, where we've been before with respect to Northern Ireland. Um, and one thing that really strikes you through the details of the Windsor framework is just quite how, um, uh, uh, how committed the two sides seem to be to avoiding confrontation where possible. So if there's difficulties, um, that they will talk about them. And they will use the committee um, institutions, the joint committee in particular, to try and find resolution. Um, and in relation to that, it's, it's notable now that the Commission is moving to close um, the infringement proceedings that have been started with respect to the protocol. Um, uh, although, of course, the, the final conclusion of that will depend on the implementation of the Windsor framework in full, which we'll come to in the next um, uh, discussion, I think. And then last but not least, again, something positive in the Windsor framework is that we saw concrete actions to build trust between the two sides. So it wasn't just 
similar rhetoric or um, empty words. There were actually things such as access to data, um, more commitments or explicit commitment on building um, uh, border control posts, etc. So those three things, the evidence, um, the commitment uh, to mutually agreeable solutions and the trust building actions, I think are really positive and do um, indicate that this rhetoric around a new chapter actually has some, some substance. Thank you. And from the London side, Simon? Yeah, really just to, to echo what Stefan and, and Katie are saying, Windsor is a positive development. Uh, and certainly in the, in the context of the period since the UK left, it marks a, a change in approach and uh, process. And, and rather than repeat the, the aspects that they've mentioned, I, I think what it also does is that it underlines, uh, it's a reaffirmation of the UK government's commitment to the structures of the withdrawal agreement, that in changing or adapting the protocol, it uh, <coughs> underlines that the protocol is something that is a legitimate part of the process and the system, which you know was the, the basic problem, that mm -hmm. there, there seemed to be a, a visceral uh, rejection of those structures, particularly under Boris Johnson. I think, you know, from the London side, the thing that has changed is that since Boris Johnson stopped being Prime Minister, you saw that shift. You saw it with Liz Truss, uh, briefly, uh, and then you've seen it uh, at a bit more length with uh, Rishi Sunak, that there is this uh, more pragmatic effort to engage. So it's partly about the changing context with Ukraine, but it's also about the changing domestic constellation here in the UK. And that's also reflected, I think, more generally in the way that those uh, committees that Stefan's talked about for the withdrawal agreement, for the trade and cooperation agreements, uh, that Andrew Ledson was talking about the parliamentary uh, partnership assembly. All of those institutions had been rather slow to get going, particularly with the TCA, but now we've had everything go through at least one cycle, if not two, which I think suggests that we're getting a degree of normalization of the, the basic architecture of what we have, um, which provides opportunities for the next step. Thank you. Tom, do you agree? I think there is a general consensus that there is a, a more fruitful relationship beginning budding at this time. But I think that there is some vital context to this. It's very tempting in this conversation to believe that history began in 2016. And I, and I don't think that that's the right place to start this conversation. I think it's right to look at the rhetoric that existed between the UK and the EU for the final few years of, of membership before the referendum. Uh, it's right to look at how little David Cameron was able to achieve on his grand tour of all the European capitals in the run-up to the referendum. It's right to look at David Cameron's failed attempt to block Jean-Claude Juncker's uh, candidacy and indeed uh, eventual uh, assent to the, to the Commission presidency. It's right to look at the British vetoes that were deployed during the Eurozone crisis and, and to look at the Conservative Party leaving the European People's Party. Indeed, the rhetoric from senior politicians, prime ministers who time and time again in the, in the years, even decades leading up to the United Kingdom's withdrawal from the European Union would often blame the European Union for many domestic problems. And there's debates to be had as term, in terms of how much the European Union may or may not have been to blame for those issues. But I don't think it's right to imagine that there was sort of a, a panacea of European relations before 2016. In fact, to some extent, now that politicians can't easily blame the European Union for problems in the United Kingdom, uh, this could present a, a, a more positive foundation for future relations. There was a phrase that was used in the referendum that is uh, the opportunity to, to lose a bad tenant and gain a good neighbour. Uh, and potentially, that's sort of what we could be starting to see. Of course, it's early days, and we have had a bit of a torrid period over the last uh, five or so years. But clearly, there is goodwill on either side, and cooperation is something that is at the forefront of all political leaders' lips. And finding that framework to cooperate, seeing the UK gladly join 
collaborative and cooperative uh, organisations or, or indeed forums like the European political community, those are all positive steps and it means that there is the potential for this sort of normalised relationship of two sovereign neighbours getting on as many other neighbours around the world do. Thank you. I'm conscious, although this panel has built the future, inevitably we end up looking back somewhat to the past. And I just want to ask, Stefan, um, that Tom refers to, um, for the Brexit nerds, the 2016 settlement agreement. Now, that may be something that's passed quite a lot of people by, but that was the David Cameron's um, uh, renegotiation. With hindsight, do you think the EU should have been a bit more generous? Mm. <laughs> No, is the, <laughs> <laughs> is the short answer and then follows the explanation. Uh, we were very generous. Uh, and I know that people on the Brexit side here, or perhaps people who regret Brexit a bit, because in, the, in one sense, the people who still argue that wished that Cameron could have got more ammunition from Brussels to win the referendum here. I think once you call a referendum, it was a, basically an in-out question rather than in, in some kind of reformed EU, and that's the basic parameters in which that referendum took place. But if I come then to the Cameron settlement itself, um, part of what I also explain in the book is why that unity of the 27 was there and the transparency also that we practiced during the negotiations was inspired by the first tour of capitals of Michel Barnier where he went to see prime ministers and where some, especially in the East said, we never want to see repeated the fact that you s Brussels or other capitals strike deals with London without us being fully in the know, because you had restricted free movement of people there, uh, perhaps more marginally than the UK wanted, but it was certainly more seriously than what many people in the EU wanted in certain capitals. And so that indivisibility of the four freedoms that Merkel immediately put forward after the referendum happened, the fact that Cameron's deal was no longer on the table, there would be no cherry picking of the single market. That's not hindsight, I think. That's also foresight where we are today. We can come back on that. But there is but cherry that, picking, but, isn't there? What? <laughs> Northern Ireland is cherry picking. Absolutely, because of the Good Friday Agreement. And people tend to forget that when they say there is cherry picking, there is a Good Friday Agreement and a very unique circumstance in terms of the peace process, avoiding the hard border, the all island economy, and all the rest of it. And then squaring that with protecting the integrity of the single market, which I should say to the benefit of three different prime ministers uh, in the UK, the ter in, in terms of the agreements we struck, perhaps not always in terms of the compliance in one prime minister's case, but in terms of the agreements we struck, all three prime ministers committed to these three parameters, protecting the integrity of the single market with Ireland's place in it, uh, avoiding the hard border and protecting the all island economy, Theresa May, uh, Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak. So uh, those three prime ministers have subscribed through the withdrawal agreement and then through the Windsor framework now through, through those parameters. And well, and that's then, but that's again history then we, uh, Ollie Robbins was on the previous panel. He worked very hard in October, November 18 to make sure that that was kind of soft and that was a UK white customs union, but that's all water under the bridge right now. No? So let's not rehash the past too much. I think we need to look forward to a more positive future. Just before we move on, um, <laughs> the, the number, one of the questions on, on, popular on Slido is to what extent was the EU, your team, motivated by a desire to discourage other member states from leaving? Um, the fear of contagion was in the minds of some national governments a life issue, I think. Contagion of Brexit, therefore, you know, all the neologisms we had at the time in terms of Nexit, Frexit, Dalexit, Swexit, <laughs> <laughs> and a few others. <laughs> Don't remind me too much of that period, please. But um, the contagion was certainly the first four or five months of life issue that disappeared after that. I mean, what, what Brexit at heart allowed you to do was to rediscover the fundamental principles on which the European integration project is built and reassess and rediscover for some the value of what is it to be in a customs union, what is the single market, how much benefit does that give to us. Um, and that, I think, was a, an important political process as well on the EU side to rediscover, kind of re renew our vows, so to say, or to renew the commitment to that project. Um, 
and, and its economic importance, but also its political importance. And I think the latter aspect has perhaps been underestimated by some on the Brexit negotiation side, not all, but some in, in this country. So, I know there's a desire to look forward rather than backwards. I wonder if we could um, start to think about, uh, given that the Windsor framework has opened things up and it's become more positive, um, does, does this mean that all is sweetness and light, Katie, in Northern Ireland? Um, you probably um, don't need me to, to answer that. Jen. No, um, if only that were the case. Uh, so there's two challenges. So first and <coughs> foremost, there's the practicalities of the Windsor framework. And one thing that we've had is this ongoing question, I think, with respect to the particular arrangements in Northern Ireland um, has been, is it a lack of capacity in the UK in terms of implementing these things? And indeed, when I say UK, I don't just mean officials, I also mean businesses um, and authorities, or is it a lack of will? And now I think if we're clear that there's, there's not a lack of will, there is the intention there on the UK side to implement this, um, the, the question of capacity comes in now. And what the Windsor Framework requires is very significant in a, quite a short space of time. Um, the first test, if you like, being labelling. So this is where we get to the nitty gritty of things. Um, so on, on milk and on uh, freshly packed meat products, for example, by the 1st of October, we're going to have to have not the EU labels um, being um, evident on goods being sold in Northern Ireland um, uh, that have come in with trusted traders that don't necessarily um, uh, that aren't, uh, include those that aren't going through the red lane. So um, that's an immediate test. Um, and then there are other, there's this trusted trade, the two trusted trader schemes that upon which this Windsor framework will rely, so-called green lanes rely on this. Um, those are very complicated arrangements to set up. Um, and the time frame for those, again, that's quite tight, even though we've got a period of time for implementing them. Um, so I, I sort of mentioned these because there's a question as to how this is going to happen, not least given that the UK border target operating model is also meant to come into force in October. So there's a lot of challenges there practically. On the political front, uh, not quite sweetness and light. Um, we know that um, the majority of parties have accepted the Windsor framework, cautiously welcomed it. They have some concerns about some elements. Uh, but the DUP, which was, of course, the intended, basically, a focus in the negotiations of the Windsor Framework, remains unhappy. Um, and this is where we come back to a, a fundamental challenge for Northern Ireland. How can you make uh, potential adjustments or um, interpretations or spins or um, modifications, whatever it might be, of the Windsor Framework or the environment for it? Or indeed, of Northern Ireland's place in the Union in a way that will reassure the DUP sufficiently um, without um, putting the cat amongst the pigeons and causing negative ramifications for the rest of the community here. That balance remains very difficult to achieve um, and it remains a sort of a live issue uh, for the UK government, even though I readily acknowledge it probably isn't a, a very um, pressing issue of concern now. There is, a, there is a sense that maybe the UK government has, has moved on in its attentions. Thank you. And Simon, um, it's all going swimmingly here too. That's one perspective. Um, <laughs> I think the, the issue, it, it, it's Tom's point, it's, you know, there's lots of potential, but potential is not the same as a, a clear program uh, of what follows. And I think this is the real difficulty, that we have a system that is operational, but we're not entirely clear what the next steps should be. And uh, you know, we, we can see that, I think, in a number of different areas. I and mean, firstly, we might think about Horizon, which was touted as, you know, this is a quick win that we can get off the back of Windsor. We had an re immediate reopening of negotiations about that. And we've fallen back into the sands of questions about financing, which is completely reasonable on both sides. You know, the, the UK would like to pay in less, the EU would like to pay in uh, the UK to pay more, and we kind of stuck a bit on that. So, you know, even something that looked like a, a fairly simple kind of thing to do, uh, it turns out, you know, that there are other imperatives apart from the trust issue. So, you know, trust is not 
enough by itself to overcome uh, reaching happiness and uh, light between the, the different parties. I think what we're also seeing is a, a quite scattergun approach from the UK government. We've got a lot of different initiatives in different areas progressing at very different speeds. Uh, the EPC meeting that we had in Moldova last week. Could you just remind us what EPC so, is? So uh, this was uh, a new, uh, very informal forum set up uh, off the back of a French initiative uh, last year um, and you know, brings together European leaders from across the continent and so stimulated a lot by uh, the war in Ukraine. So as a, a place in which the UK could make and be part of Europe-wide discussions, uh, multilaterally, bilaterally, very positive, both in Prague last year in the autumn and uh, in Chisinau uh, this last week. But that's not coming with a lot of substance behind it. It's, you know, it's being in the room, but that's not the same as being part of strong and effective decision making. So I think that there's a, a challenge there about what goes on. We're also seeing a lot of bilateral instruments coming through. So the UK is doing a lot. We've had Georgia Maloney come uh, to sign a memorandum of understanding on uh, migration uh, back in uh, the end of April. A lot of other kinds of efforts to kind of build links, which is very piecemeal and doesn't really seem to have a clear focus and, and set of priorities. And I, I think the other thing that speaks to that lack of coordination is the domestic politics here in the UK. So we, as much as we have uh, got past the good old days of 2017, 2018, 2019, happy times, um, we still have the retained EU law bill going through Parliament, and notwithstanding the government's recent amendments, that still comes with some very significant uh, challenges in relation to compliance with trade and, co uh, trade and cooperation agreement obligations on the level playing field, so making sure that standards in environmental protection, work protection, social standards are maintained. That, you know, whilst we're not having the sunsetting of all EU law in the UK, we're still going to have the potential for some un unintended effects on that. And then the uh, illegal immigration bill also raises some potential issues, particularly if the government decides to push more substantially down the line of uh, limiting or withdrawing its uh, participation in the European Convention on Human Rights, which is an obligation of the trade and cooperation agreements. So part of this is we still seem to be, how many years has it been? Seven, seven years since the referendum. We still seem to be discovering the way in which things are connected. And we don't have uh, a clear strategy or coordination around this issue. Um, so the European policy is shaped by domestic policy uh, in ways that aren't immediately appreciated or particularly taken account of. So I think we, we, we have a lot of challenges ahead. And again, it's that question of potential for what uh, that I think is the, uh, the challenge here. So Tom, I'm going to ask you the same question. All going swimmingly? I can't just, I just can't imagine that it was seven years ago. It makes me feel a lot older than a lot of people tell me I am. Um, <laughs> but but I, I think that perhaps over those last seven years, we have seen a remarkable degree of European Union unity, which has paid dividends in terms of negotiations. The, the, the genius stroke of sort of a political figure heading those negotiations in the shape of Michel Barnier, uh, presenting that unified front from the European Union was a total negotiation masterstroke, and it presented the European Union as a formidable negotiating partner. Meanwhile, the United Kingdom had Theresa May, who, uh, who decided to hold an election to strengthen her hand, proceeded to not quite win it, uh, and then was scrabbling around for a last-minute December agreement in 2017 that set this awful sequencing for these talks. Let's not forget that Vote Leave, under the leadership of Dominic Cummings, said that Article 50 should never be triggered. The Vote Leave plan, if you want to call it that, was to have lots of discussions and find a way to collaboratively talk this thing through without that famous ticking <coughs> clock. And uh, instead, what we saw was, was panic, bad sequencing, and a weakened executive 
in the face of a rebellious parliament that meant that the UK asks got increasingly erratic and indeed increasingly extreme, pushed around by uh, very small and yet perhaps outsizedly influential pockets in Parliament. Um, it was a disastrous few years between the 2017 election and the 2019 election. Um, however, I, I think it's arguable to say that more political stability in the United Kingdom leads to better and more fruitful relationships with the European Union. When the executive feels stronger and perhaps more empowered in this country, friendlier relations can take place, uh, which is perhaps why um, last summer was, was less than ideal. Um, maybe why things are, 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 are looking up in terms of uh, the next decades or so. But uh, I, I think it, it's hard to overstate how internal divisions in the United Kingdom have led to uh, perhaps an uneven set of negotiations, confused asks, and a less than ideal, uh, again, I go back to seven years, uh, of all of these talks. It's interesting you say that, isn't it? Because, I mean, some people might argue that Vote Leave didn't have a plan, and it's easy to blame Theresa May and her government um, when she was fighting against some really very strong headwinds. Uh, that, that, it's right to say there was no command paper for this, um, but there were clear instructions or clear um, ideas for what Vote Leave wanted to do. And, and the great tragedy of this is that the Brexiteers were never then left in control of Brexit. The people that sort of seized control of the executive afterwards were the quote-unquote sensibles within the Conservative Party, uh, which led to this big problem of, number one, uh, domestic instability, whereby you had, uh, you had the repeated refrain, where's that 350 million for the NHS? Well, of course, had Boris Johnson or Michael Gove or one of the vote leavers uh, become Prime Minister, that would be one of the first things they would have done, and they said so repeatedly. Um, but, but also, frankly, it, it would have been for vote leave to answer the questions that were had on it. Uh, the, the, the big refrain was, you know, uh, oh, you didn't elect to vote leave, but a lot of people felt like they sort of did. And I think one of the big problems is that then the people that ran that campaign were shut out of government and weren't allowed to really answer for what they campaigned for. And, and you had this but mess. Of course, I mean, Boris Johnson has since negotiated a deal and we were told it was oh, another no, revenue no. deal. So, he, I mean, when he was On put the terms in charge... of Theresa May. I mean, he tweaked Theresa May's deal um, and, and, and fundamentally followed the Article 50 process the EU's sequencing requests. This was entirely a process of, number one, the EU's ideal sequencing, and number two, a hung parliament led by a weak Remain voting prime minister. So given you said that people felt that they'd voted for vote leave, there's a question here that public support is, of course, changing at the moment, certainly if the polls are, are correct. Um, now, of course, there's a difference between people being disappointed with Brexit outcome and people wanting to rejoin. But how, how do you answer to the 56, 60 percent who are now saying that Brexit was a mistake? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, things in this country do not seem all that rosy right now. And we've had a lot of uh, political instability and indeed economic instability. Now, I think uh, it would be entirely erroneous to lay that all at the foot of Brexit. Uh, if there was a more competent leader in the 2017 general election, uh, perhaps there would have been a lot more political stability in this country. Uh, and I will forever, uh, regret the wrong word, but, but be uh, deeply frustrated that the pandemic hit precisely at the time that the Trade and Cooperation Agreement was meant to be um, implemented or, or, or was, was going through at that same time. Uh, all of this stuff is going to be incredibly muddled for a long, long time. And ultimately, if the government is unpopular and people associate the government with Brexit, Brexit becomes unpopular. I don't think that that's a particularly complicated sequence of events to follow. I don't think it's all that surprising that the polls 
would show that. Now, whether that would actually uh, materialise into a, a public desire to go through a referendum and another seven years of negotiations and, 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 and to rip this country into yet again, I, I, I just don't see that a poll like that would translate to a material demand <laughs> from people to change the political settlement uh, that we're sort of haphazardly stumbling towards. Thank you. So, Stefan, if it's not Theresa May's fault, it's your fault for being uh, too um, uh, un un unanimous and a formidable negotiating partner. That's what maybe you should put that in your front of your book. Um, so, you were a formidable negotiating partner, so you got what you wanted. Is that true? And also, looking forward, given we are where we are, what, what, what's your assessment? Well, we, the main reason why we were in my view, indeed, a good negotiating team was that we had the un united support of 27 national governments and their trusts. I mean, we were the agent negotiating on behalf of the principles, which is, apart from the European Parliament, the 27 prime ministers, heads of state and government in, in the European Council. And so that's, I think, why we had a, a successful, quote-unquote, negotiation on our side to get Brexit done, as, I, as, a, as the subtitle of my book is. Um, and that wasn't there clearly, it, let, Andrea let some refer to the hung parliament under Theresa May, clearly that kind of trust was not there between the UK's negotiating team and at least some of the principals, which are ultimately the MPs, who had to vote this, for this deal. But I, I mean, yeah, there is quite a bit to be said about how the UK then negotiated, but um, I think that that's neither here nor there anymore. I think today we are we have these two agreements. I think it'd be interesting well, to hear your views. <laughs> well, I'm certainly interested to hear that some people in the Vote Leave campaign thought the first thing they should do was not use the agreed procedure to leave and not trigger <laughs> Article 50. And therefore, the idea was to violate the agreed procedure from Brussels' perspective. Then we had a treaty ratified by the UK Parliament uh, where there was an agreed procedure on how a country could leave. Uh, and, and, and luckily, that was the, the way in which the UK decided to leave. Uh, luckily for the European uh, Union, perhaps. Well, luckily for the UK, too, in terms of its honouring international legal obligations, uh, I would say. And that's quite important if I have carefully listened to the, to the first panel as well in the current geopolitical turbulence that you, as a country, you, you reaffirm your commitment to international law, certainly uh, in the current context on the European continent. I think that that's absolutely fundamental. Um, so well, I, also, I, well, I also want to just take us away slightly yes. from the, 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 we but are where your, your, your we are. Your question is, is it going swimmingly well, you say? Yes, yeah, so. it's, go, it's going well. <laughs> um, and, um, well, is, is it going well? I mean, yeah, in terms of institutional implementation, now we're in a much better place. There's, of course, there are fewer exchanges and contacts between UK businesses and EU businesses. Trade between the UK and the EU is down, and that's a natural consequence of Brexit. That's not exactly something that, it, that is to be something can, people should rejoice over, I think, but that's just a, the way it is. And also, if I look at the last annual report on the TCA, it says that in 2021 there were 100,000 EU students in the UK, in 22, 50,000. So that's a serious drop of EU students, people-to-people -people contacts. And those are things that are damaging, I would say, for, for the people-to-people -people relationship and for the income of UK universities as well, incidentally, but that's, that's a different story. In terms of UK legislation, Simon uh, flagged two, two that are also in, in that annual report, but they haven't come to fruition yet, right? There's a legislative process going on, and so let's, let's see how that turns out. There's also the um, Data Protection Digital Information Bill, which would change the, adequacy, the conditions under which the adequacy frame, framework was given by the Commission, so that's another one to flag. But again, that's all part of UK parliamentary government procedures that, that's going through. I think what, what I would say, and that's to elaborate a little bit for one minute on the point that the two agreements are in place, we can now also build on that, I think. On Windsor, we have the three pieces of EU legislation, uh, agreed between Parliament and Council, so on medicines, on agri-food pets, on steel imports from GB to NI, uh, to avoid a negative effect on the, the steel industry there in Northern Ireland. So that has been done. On citizens' right of the withdrawal agreement, there are still application problems. Luckily, we have this independent monitoring authority that we fought hard in the 17 to put that in there to guarantee citizens' rights and their correct application. I'm sure everybody is committed to the correct application. There's just 
implementation problems that keep coming back, but okay, these well, things the, can be the, ironed out. The IMA, the Internet Monitoring Authority, is showing some real teeth. Yes, and Unlike luckily, the Commission. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I Over think, UK citizens' rights in the EU. But there is, but in the EU, this, it's rather anecdotal issues, whereas here it's sometimes systemic. So there is a big difference there, I think, in terms of the application of those rights. Um, and then on the TCA, very briefly, we have a number of work streams. Simon mentions Horizon, so the discussions are ongoing. There is a memorandum of understanding on financial services, so more regulatory cooperation within the sovereignty of each of the two. Uh, in, um, the Ukraine war also pushes us to more cooperation, a dialogue on cybersecurity, counterterrorism, winter preparedness for energy and security of supply of energy. These things have intensified in terms of cooperation. And so you get a step-by-step, -step, basically these committees doing their work and creating, the word trust was mentioned by some other panelists, a, a, more, a relationship based on trust and cooperation, which is very, which is positive. Thank you. It's technical and boring, it's what we like in Brussels. Yeah, <laughs> Te technical's good uh, from, from a bureaucrat's point of view. But that brings me now to just sort of the immediate pressing problems. And of course, one of them, and this bring, I'll turn to Katie on this, is of course how things are going to play out um, on the, in the political domain in respect of Northern Ireland. We've heard about the technical problems of um, the labelling issues and other issues generated by the Windsor Framework. But given the idea behind the Windsor Framework was to basically pave the way for Stormont to get back up and running, it ain't happened. Uh, is it likely to? Um, so we don't see any movement um, at the moment, and the local elections um, weren't decisive in a way that would indicate um, uh, any propelling of the DUP towards going back in um, immediately. Um, one thing that's quite interesting in the results in the local elections, basically it reflects, um, um, happily for me, that some of the polling that we've been doing um, with my colleague David Finnamore here in Queen's on positions on the protocol. And from that polling we see around um, two thirds of people saying that they think, and uh, now we have a Windsor framework, uh, the Northern Ireland Assembly should be restored and fully functioning. There's about 27% who say, um, no, the DUP should hold out um, for further changes. Um, and that's broadly reflected in the local elections results where we saw um, um, around 27% between the DUP and the traditional unionist voice. One thing that is worrying from our polling is, uh, which obviously they could probe a wee bit more, is the question of, well, what do people expect to see? What do they want to see with respect to adjustments? And this would indicate um, that those supportive of the DUP staying out want the protocol slash Windsor framework to be gone altogether. So um, that's obviously not a prospect that either the UK or the EU are considering. Um, this goes obviously right to the heart of the debates around Northern Ireland and its unique position, etc., through all of the Brexit process. So it's a real challenge for the DUP if they are ultimately a devolutionist party and they do want to get back into power sharing, eventually at some point, how they manage to uh, tie that all up, which goes to the next question, which I sort of hinted at before, which is what the UK government could possibly do. Um, and the expectation would be there'll be some secondary legislation to um, try and enable the DUP to um, be convinced that there have been some adjustments made. Would that come in relation to Northern Ireland's case in the UK internal market, or would it come in relation to such broader things such as um, the prospects for a border poll, something on the Northern Ireland Act? We, we don't know. But as I say, the more they tinker with that, um, the, the more concerned there'll be um, a, 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 across the wider community as to its implications. Um, fundamentally, even if we do get the Assembly up and running again, the question is how it will manage this um, very challenging environment, possibly made more challenging by the storm and break, which is a unique element brought forward in the Windsor framework, intending to give MLAs a voice in uh, the application of EU law in Northern Ireland, uh, but its exercise could be um, politically quite contentious, as you, as you might imagine. Uh, and last but not least, I think, I think relating to some of the issues that we've discussed already, 
one thing more broadly is the decreasing trust that people have in um, politics in general, in institutions in Northern Ireland, in democratic institutions. Uh, the lowest amount of trust that we see here is in the Northern Ireland executive. So even though um, just about it retains the support of the plurality in Northern Ireland as part of its long-term future, um, uh, there's increasing sense of um, or lack of confidence that it can actually function in a way that benefits Northern Ireland and is in Northern Ireland's interests. And I think that's a consequence both of what's happened in the last few years um, and also a um, widening sense of disillusionment about politics in general, um, post-Brexit, post-protocol. And um, so this sort of fits into these wider debates that I don't think we can understand Brexit um, in, without understanding those wider challenges for, for democracy and trust in institutions. Thank you, Katie. And Simon, I don't know whether you want to reflect on that from the um, Westminster side and whether we can see things getting better. Keep on asking me if things are going to get better. Um, no, um, it's a short answer. Um, I think what strikes me about the Sunak administration is that the, the model seems to be one of problem containment. So, and I think the, the Windsor is a good example of that. You know, there were clearly two objectives around Windsor. One was resolving the protocol issues and the relationship with the EU, and the other was to get the assembly up and running again. And whilst one of those has been successful, as Katie's been saying, we haven't seen success in the other. And you haven't seen the same level of London government uh, investment in trying to make the second aspect come around. You know, the kind of level of engagement that you saw during the run-up to the Good Friday Belfast Agreement uh, 25 years ago isn't there. You know, you don't see a lot of attention to the issue from London. And it's similar across different areas of policy. And, you know, in a way it's rational that, you know, for a party that is in government after a long period in power, a long way behind in the polls, uh, an exciting summer last year. Uh, all of those things, you know, this steadying the ship is, seems to be the, 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 the kind of model. And, you know, being able to have some wins to show that we, we can actually get past the, the mistakes of the past. So that model isn't going to change ahead of the, the general election next year. So, you know, that's going to be the next model. So we're not going to see this government put in place big steps. And again, from the EU perspective, and I think this kind of touches a bit on what you're talking about, Tom, you know, that uh, as much as the UK kind of constrained itself and had internal debates, this is a relationship that has two parties, that the EU also has a voice in this negotiation. So whatever the UK had reached as a, a settlement or a, a consensus after the referendum, it still would have had to have negotiated that with the EU, who clearly have uh, a, a stake in, in that process. So I think we have that kind of tension from the EU perspective, making new commitments with a government that might be out of power in 12 months or, or so, is a, a problematic kind of sell. At the same time, I maybe we'll hear differently this afternoon, you know, that Labour doesn't look like a a government that would be coming in with a radically different kind of agenda. You know, the, the basic parameters look very similar. So uh, saying we won't have the UK rejoin the single market or the customs union actually leaves a, a very limited space in which to do things. And, you, you know, it's the kind of language we've heard this morning from Andrea Leadsom, uh, from the panellists this morning, you know, that uh, a positive, constructive relationship where cooperation takes place on issues of shared interest. But what cooperation actually practically means isn't really closely inspected. You know, we kind of got some kind of uh, flagship kind of things that, you know, here's, a, here's an issue that we can work on and something like that. But in terms of a, a, a European policy that coheres, uh, we don't really see that coming through. And, you know, for Labour, who are as ahead in the polls as they are, they've done that without having gone big on a European issue. So if we're thinking again about that willingness to go down the road of a revisiting of the relationship, I'm also 
not confident that that's something that people are willing or uh, going to do. That, uh, yeah, it's one thing to say people are unhappy with how Brexit has turned out. It's another thing to say, well, we know what the, the thing is that they want in response. And so, you know, that was the thing of 2016, was this unhappiness uh, about a situation without necessarily saying we agree about what the replacement is. And I think we, we're likely to find that as we go through. And also, most people don't sit down and think about the intricacies of the trade and cooperation agreement every day. They have a general oh, some of sense. us do, I assure you. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I hope I'm not offending you or any in this room when I say that perhaps this isn't the most representative room of the, of the general country. Um, but but it is, it, I think it is an interesting point that perhaps... Labour wins the next election. They do something tokenistic on pet passports and touring musicians, and then Keir Starmer goes for a bike ride with all the EU leaders. Uh, perhaps Brexit suddenly soars in the polls. Who knows? I mean, they, they, it is incredibly fickle in terms of um, in terms of people's general attitude toward how things are going. Perhaps Keir Starmer wins the next election, passes planning reform, and the UK economy goes off with rocket boosters. Perhaps he doesn't get it past his own backbenchers. Who knows? These are so many different um, questions in terms of how people may see things that may or may not be related, and how people feel about the general sense of the country. So, given that you said earlier that things aren't that rosy at the moment, if there was Prime Minister at Harvard, what would you be doing? <laughs> <laughs> what a thought. I don't think anyone wants that for a single second. Um, but, but I think that generally, if we lived in a, in a benevolent dictatorship, and I didn't have to uh, worry about uh, a, a, a quarrelsome parliament, uh, what the United Kingdom should have done at the start of this whole process was be very clear in terms of what Brexit should look like. Given that, given that we are where we are, yeah. I, I'm going. I want to look forward. What would what would you do to to, to make the situation more rosy? Today, mm -hmm. the United Kingdom should say, "We are going for the benefits of regulatory divergence." We should go for what is often derisively called Singapore on Thames. Take the hit in terms of slightly uh, more friction between the United Kingdom and the EU's trade on one side of the ledger, and on the other side of the ledger, take the massive benefit of a deregulated uh, and, and buccaneering market economy. Just on that point, I would just like to refer to the excellent UK and a changing Europe um, divergence tracker. And one of the things that's come out of it is it's becoming very clear that divergence proves to be very difficult because there are a whole range of reasons, in part to do with Northern Ireland, in part to do with the fact that the EU still is our largest trading partner and we have to comply with the EU rules for all goods that are sold into that market. In fact, the opportunities from divergence are actually rather slim. Uh, I think there are, some, uh, they, they, there are some opportunities that perhaps seem very slim. There are other opportunities that are fundamentally enormous. Such as? Look at AI. Look at the way in which the EU is trying to regulate AI as things stand. Perhaps some of the best benefits of, of divergence isn't what we repeal with regards to what the EU has regulated already. It's what we escape in terms of what the EU is looking to do in the next 10 or 20 years. Look at how the EU has behaved towards Apple, Google, Facebook, Microsoft even. Actually, to be fair, look at how the UK regulators have behaved towards Microsoft in the last couple of weeks as well. But given the opportunity to do things differently, the potential in terms of escaping a European dirigist economic model and perhaps more closely following an American open market economy when it comes to particularly technological innovation, the opportunity of AI, the, the, the growth industries of the next 10 or 20 years, the inward looking and controlling European economic model uh, could well knock back this continent and being tied to that, being tied to a continent that tries to micromanage what Google can show in its own search results and tries to control what companies can do in terms of purchases and, uh, and in terms of general innovation. Imagine if the European Commission had been the guys that were regulating the early days of the internet. That's where we are with AI. Potentially, what we're going to see is a, is a, is a firewalled world, and I'd much rather be on the free and open internet 
than being on the firewalled European internet, the great firewall of the EU. Right, thank you. So, um, Stefan, um, could I, you might want to say something on that, but yes, I'm please. particularly interested in hearing your view, as, as many people in this audience will know, that there is um, due to be a review of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement five years after it um, came into force, that's sort of 2025, 2026. Is this, and I want to bring together a number of questions um, that uh, have come in on Slido, is there any interest in the EU to be able to have some sort of closer relationship and a reset? Is there um, the possibility of having a free movement of persons deal? Uh, is there um, what Labour is talking about, which Simon's just referred to, um, as John Peter asked, is this about um, essentially a different form of cherry picking? Right. And two very quick points on, on Tom's uh, interesting remarks. On the Singapore on Thames, OBR figures seem to suggest that the UK has 40 billion less tax revenue a year because of the negative hit of Brexit on the economy. So how then to fund public services and go to that model puzzles me. On AI, next week European Parliament will vote and then the Council and the Parliament will get together and then we'll see what comes out of that. But our goal, to be clear, is to attract AI to Europe to the European Union um, and to develop it and to create a regulatory framework that allows it to develop it uh, and regulate the high risk elements in line with fundamental rights, data protection, ethics standards and, and all the rest of it. And I don't think that that's a bad thing. And hopefully we can be one of the first powerful economic blocks in the world to accept that, to, to adopt that regulation and also set standards. And we're working with the Americans on the code of conduct. And that probably will need to work with the industry to make sure the legislation, which hopefully will be adopted soon, can kick in a bit earlier on a voluntary basis, given the rapid developments there. But I just wanted to flag that. And on the review, I find it that one of the hardest questions to answer. I mean, for sure, the integrity of the single market is something that is there in terms of the questions and, and will not be questioned. But what exactly will come from the EU side, uh, I find it hard to answer because it's the next mandate, there's an election in the meantime, we need to construct this together with 27 national governments. The TCA has a commitment to review, so it's a, an obligation to do an effort, but it's not a results-oriented obligation. Um, and, in, and, and the important thing is in the meantime, what happens between now and that review? Can we have the Horizon Agreement? Hopefully soon. We're working on it. Can we have other steps forward in terms of cooperation? What I would, one thing said, perhaps on the UK, listening also to Simon and his point that there is a need for a European policy that coheres. Well, I leave that for, for, for UK experts to say if that exists or not. But since I speak in a personal capacity and since we would like to have a fruitful review, for me, the starting point for the review on the UK side cannot be unhappiness with what happened over the last seven years and how the EU can perhaps help to make you happier. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the role of the EU. Uh, and, and put it more seriously in terms of the, 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 the barriers that were created and to, to, to trade and, and, and the new equilibrium that was found. I think it would indeed be much more fruitful to start from, uh, okay, these are the negative impacts of Brexit. What is the country here going to do domestically in terms of economic, industrial strategy or not to tackle those issues and from that starting point and come to that review, which I think is the way the EU will come to that review. What what is in our interest, basically? Is there anything in our interest? And if so, what is it? And, and that will be my final brief point. I think we need to be mindful that the EU is really evolving in a way that with all the difficulties and without becoming self-congratulatory, is a more united than what we were used to in the past, but also more focused on technological sovereignty, the CHIPS Act and funding. Uh, an industrial plan to reply to Biden's Inflation Reduction Act with funding, hopefully, that will be a difficult discussion, regulation, trade with reliable partners, including the UK, uh, more investment in skills, more domestic production of critical raw materials, net zero industry act, so more support also for manufacturing in the EU, which is a big concern of many of the national governments today. Um, building up clearance capacity to have a 
more integrated capital markets union. That's a very slow process because that's years and decades that the EU is working on that. Some of it's going faster, some of it's going slower, but it all goes into a direction where the EU is more confident and forceful and has more policy tools as well as it's centrally available. Um, and also then is more in a mindset of what is in our interest and how do we defend that in terms of realpolitik, so to say, since Kissinger became a hundred, you can maybe quote that. But how do you defend your own interest beyond the values that, that you want to defend? And I think that's, will that continue? I think so. It's a bit difficult to predict, but I think this is something that will continue. It's certainly a new discourse in terms of that open strategic autonomy that, uh, that the EU and the Commission is working on. Thank you. We're coming to the end of our time. Um, but I want to conclude with one question. For, uh, it's the same question for all of you. Cast your mind forward to 2050. What will be the UK's relationship with the EU by then? Will we be members? Will the EU still exist? Or what? Um, Katie, do you want to start? Um. I think the, the question there is whether the UK itself will exist. Um, <laughs> um, and most clearly we see the, the, the impact of Brexit on public opinion in Northern Ireland with respect to Irish unification when we've seen similar trends in Scotland and even in Wales. So uh, the nature of the UK I think shouldn't be taken for granted significantly changed post-Brexit and um, we see all the evidence suggests it's going to be, it's not going to return to the way it was. So there's fundamental changes happening and um, so 2050 for me, um, uh, yes we don't know what we're talking about really with respect to the UK and, and the European Union are absolutely right, will it exist or will it take on a very different form um, and inevitably if it does um, have the new members that um, it's, it's looking likely to have, um, that body too will fundamentally change. Um, so um, fascinating questions, but I'm struggling to work on what's going to happen in the next six months, if I'm honest. <laughs> Tom, what do you think? I'm going to give a future, perhaps not the future. But the United Kingdom decides to repeal ridiculous EU gene editing restrictions. We decide to do away with our version of the Europeans' Digital Markets Act and move forward in a way that allows the sort of technological innovation that will drive the growth of the future in this country. As a little bonus, we pass housing reform and actually build some houses as well. Uh, and what happens is the United Kingdom is this sort of uh, dynamic uh, islands off the, off the coast of the mainland becomes this, this innovative policy hub. What the United Kingdom does is save herself through her exertions and perhaps even save Europe through her example. Can I just pick you up on one technical point? <laughs> Which is that, of course, we were never bound by the Digital Markets Act. It only came no, no, into force no, that's, that's this, that, that, this year. That's exactly what I said. I said what we're doing now, well, what this current government is doing is, is copying the EU's Digital Markets Act. What I'm saying is we should ditch that and use those opportunities of not being bound by that act uh, in order to, uh, to innovate in this space. And particularly to prove to the European Union that you can have... Uh, gene editing, for example, that we can pursue vertical farming, that we can do all the interesting and innovative things that the EU is oh so scared of right now. And perhaps if we do them well, the EU will copy us. And through that sort of policy experimentation, we all become richer. So I'll take it as a no that um, we won't be a member, in your view, that we will not be a member of the EU in 2050. I doubt it. Simon, what do you think? I uh, just had a vision of myself in 2050 at a conference like this, <laughs> <laughs> Dis discussing what the UK's relationship with the EU might be. If, uh, if, like. if the ESRC continues to fund us, we'll, well all be here. I'm sure we can all hope. Um, I, 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 20, well, if you go back the same amount of time, the EU was a very different place. You know, the kind of mid-90s, it was before Eastern enlargement, before uh, the single currency had 
actually being confirmed was going to happen. You know, there's, there's a huge amount that can change. The just geopolitics can shift so much. So I think, you know, it's, in some extent, it's imponderable. The one thing that I see as a constant is British uncertainty about what its place in Europe is. You know, you can, well, you can take it in a grand historical view if you like, but even just in the post-war period, you know, it, there's uh, uncertainty. You know, is it about kind of being a balance for power? Is it about sort of crisis management? Is it about not getting too entangled? You know, we kind of sit uneasily and, you know, we kind of keep on having these debates. And, you know, it kind of goes back to that discussion on the previous panel about, you know, do we need a role? Do we need to have clarity? But I think it is going to be a leitmotif that the UK's sense of self and its relationship is going to be contested. I think that's probably as, as close as we can get. So, yes, we will be having that panel in 2050. Um, probably virtually with holograms and <laughs> silver space well, suits. If, if ABBA were performing, that would be good. <laughs> better. Um, Stefan, what do you reckon? <laughs> yeah, um, there may be four AI uh, panelists, uh, <laughs> robots <laughs> talking. <laughs> um, I did the same as Simon, go back 27 years, and in 96, so John Major's Prime Minister, Tony Blair comes one year later to put the UK at the heart of Europe, and so here we are 27 years <laughs> later. <laughs> so where are we in 2050? I think Tom's point is valid in terms of regulatory competition that may happen, uh, and that could be healthy to some extent, as long as it is within the commitments of the, frame, of the TCA framework short term. We'll see if the TCA, where that is in 2050, but there could be some healthy regulatory competition from having a prosperous neighbor, good neighbor, as Andrea Letzum said there, and experimenting with a number of things, as, as Tom said. That could also put healthy pressure on the EU. But in terms of where we then will be in 2050 with the UK or not, it would be more than 27 members for sure. I would, well, for not for sure, but I think there will be more than 27 members. It will depend on how we react to shocks wars, climate change, China perhaps, um, migration, refugees. Um, if you look at the last year now, we are cooperating extremely well with the UK on sanctions against Russia. We wouldn't have predicted that two years ago, I would think. So it's very hard to, to predict, but I, I hope that when we have these shocks that we come to closer operational cooperation, whether then will lead us in 2050 in terms of UK being a member or not, that's, that's really something I can't, I can't answer. But I think if you look, and then, that's my final point, come back to the European political community, that's 40 plus members, so we're already 27 EU members today, three in the single market with Norway, that's 30, perhaps nine extra members, that's 39, so it's going to become quite lonely outside of the EU maybe. <laughs> <laughs> So just to conclude, can I just have a show of hands amongst the audience? How many, do you th how many of you think, it's not what your desire is, but how many of you think the UK will be a member of the EU in 2050? So it looks, to my, about a third? Yeah, about a third? Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed to all of you for your very lively and thought-provoking contributions. Thank you to the audience for your questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them on Slido, but I hope I got through quite a lot of them. Thank you to Katie in particular um, in lovely Belfast. Um, and we're now closing this session. Uh, time for lunch. Thank you very much indeed.